Good morning. And welcome to worship on this beautiful morning. A special welcome to the many guests and visitors that we have here this day. It is good to see you and to worship the Lord together. We also like to welcome our live stream congregation that stretches across the northern United States and way up into Regina, Saskatchewan, and Edmonton, Alberta, and Medicine Hat, and other places. It's just good uh, to have you with us also. I don't think you realize in this country, or at least down in this area, how important it is for people in places where there are no congregations open, like in many places in the north, northwest, and into Canada. So when you sing today, sing loud. They count on hearing you and your faith also. Note the flowers this day are placed by Ted and Nikki Duffy in memory of their son Patrick. We thank you for those. The other flowers here are from the memorial service for Fred Freund yesterday. Note also the announcements in the back of the bulletin. If you're heading out of town, please let us know your time of departure, address to send newsletter, and return date. Next Saturday will be the last four o'clock Saturday worship service. That might not affect anyone here, but please welcome those refugees that come from that service next, uh, the Sunday after that. Uh, next Sunday, during the fellowship hour, we have a person that's coming to speak to us about our endowment fund that was set up within the last year as to what that's all about, what it does, what it means, and to answer questions. That will be during the fellowship hour after worship. The book club continues to meet on Thursday. The men's breakfast is on Saturday, May 1st. And there is a work day this coming Saturday at Faith from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. And they will have coffee and they will have donuts. So those that require that at 9 o'clock will be satisfied and they appreciate the help that we give them. As we worship this day, we celebrate our Lord's Supper. Our Lord's Supper is open to all baptized believers who trust in Jesus as Savior and who seek to learn to live with him as Lord of all areas of life. At this time, it is served in a different way in that you come forward down the aisle, you'll receive the wafer, the body of Christ in your hand, and have a choice between glasses with two different liquids. The darker colored liquid is wine. The lighter colored liquid in the center is white grape juice, the blood of Christ. We do ask that you would kindly fill out one of these colorful communion slips that uh, should be in the pew rack. Fully fill out the front side. There is room for prayer concerns at the bottom that are given to the prayer ministry later today. A number of options are on the reverse side that you are able to use or respond to or communicate with the office, whatever you need to, and then just simply place that if you're bringing offerings in the plates at the back of the church. Please stand. Let us begin our worship on page four as we affirm together that God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us silently confess our sin against God and one another. Risen Lord, we admit that we are slow to believe and even slower to follow wherever you lead us. We doubt your promise, divide your people, and fail to proclaim the power of your resurrection. We choose to live small lives when you've given us the biggest gift of all, your eternal life. Forgive us, raise us up to a place where you can serve you faithfully. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ has been given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on us the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our gathering Him.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Together we pray, God of might, your messenger's words were not always well received, but they were full of your truth. Give us courage to speak out in the face of injustice and opposition, confident that you will strengthen us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated for the worship carol. Thank you. 
please stand for the singing of the gospel acclamation and the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for this third Sunday of Easter is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> a guy dies, and he arrives at the pearly gates. And St. Peter is there, and St. Peter asks him to relate a good deed that he has done. The man thinks for a moment, and then says, Well, there was this time I was driving down a road when I saw a group of hoodlums harassing a girl. So I stopped my car, grabbed a tire iron, and walked up to the leader of the gang. He was huge six feet four inches tall, 260 pounds with a studded leather jacket and tattoos and a chain running from his nose to his ears. As I approached him, the others circled me and told me to get lost or I'd be next. So I grabbed the leader's chain and ripped it out of his face and smashed him over the head with a tire iron. Then I yelled at them, leave this girl alone. You're acting like a bunch of animals. Go home before I teach you a lesson in pain. And St. Peter was marveling at this. He was awed. He said, when did you do all that? The fellow looked at his watch and said, about three minutes ago. <laughs> Sometimes you get killed for doing what's right, don't you? It doesn't always turn out the way that we think it will. Today, we're going to turn our attention to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which really should be called, as I've said before, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it is here that we learn what many Christians have not heard. We learn about Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church. When Ruth Bell, who would later marry Billy Graham, was a little girl, she had a passion for martyrdom. You see, she grew up in China, where her parents were missionaries, and she used to pray every night that the Lord would let her become a martyr before the end of the year. She wanted bandits to capture and behead her for Jesus' sake. Her sister used to think how horrid so every night when Ruth prayed like that, Rosa would pray, Lord, don't you listen to her. A Jewish friend of mine always referred to that as prayer block. So while we should not pray to be martyred, we should desire to imitate the bold witness of those who have given their lives for the sake of the gospel. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, left us a godly and courageous example. And even his name has meaning. It means victor's crown. Now, a question, and we'll need a show of hands. How many people here would like to be a member of a fast-growing, spiritually alive church that serves the needs of people and is involved throughout the community, reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. 
Wow, yeah, that sounds pretty tempting. It sounds like a wonderful church to be part of. Think about it. Wouldn't it be great if the church suddenly grew by thousands? The book of Acts demonstrates that that is possible. But it also reminds us to be careful of what we wish for because growth isn't always painless. Growth isn't always easy. It means that we have to deal with real-life challenges and changes. But because our Lord Jesus is victorious and risen, in the end, it's all worth it. But we need to see that any kind of growth, any kind of change in the community of the faithful faces internal tensions. I'll ask you another question. How do you measure growth? Is it the number of butts in pews? Is it an increase in offerings? If you look at the New Testament, it's neither one. Because growth really means that the number of disciples is increasing. The number of the servants of God actively involved is increasing. If you look at the early church in the book of Acts, you'll see that the church grew from the 12 apostles to the 120 that were there at Pentecost, to 3,000, and then to 5,000, fairly rapidly. And its makeup was entirely of people of the Jewish background. It was centered in Jerusalem. Another question, what is the church from growing today? Yet in this early church, there was conflict. There were some sore spots between different believers, if you can imagine that. Hebraic Jews were from Palestine and spoke Hebrew. Grecian Jews were born outside of Palestine and spoke Greek. Well, the Grecian Jews had a complaint. Their widows, they didn't feel were were being handled well, that they were being neglected in the daily distribution of the food, and this was their only sustenance. Now, they could have played the race card, but they didn't. Think about it for a second, a different question. What are some of the internal struggles the church faces today? Well, at least in Africa, the problem was handled wisely. It was handled well. The apostles did keep their focus on the ministry of word and prayer, but they didn't sacrifice the ministry of care and service either. In other words, they got help. They appointed seven men to handle the food distribution. But it wasn't like they took volunteers. The men they chose were well qualified, as the text says, they were full of the spirit and of wisdom. These men actually represented the party that had been feeling slighted. They had Greek names. This group even included a convert to Judaism, a proselyte from Antioch. Another question, how can we apply some of those same principles when we face things today? As a result, the word of God spread, and there was an even greater explosion of growth within Jerusalem, and a number of the priests were also included. But with growth, the church began to face external opposition. Stephen was full of the spirit and wisdom, and he became the center of the conflict or the opposition. He had a reputation, and as that grew, he became increasingly important, and he was one who was full of the faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and power, and he did great wonders and miraculous signs, and so conflict boiled up again. There was a synagogue. It was called the Synagogue of the Free Men. They were Roman slaves of Jewish background who had been set free 
and were living in Jerusalem. Now, perhaps they might have felt threatened, might have felt jealous about the situation, but they, they couldn't fight fair. They couldn't stand up to Stephen's wisdom or to the spirit. So they used some alternate methods that we see every day in the world. They used politics and deception and force. And they stirred up the people by making false accusations. It resulted in Stephen being brought before the Sanhedrin, just like Jesus was. And Stephen, like Jesus, answered the accusations against him calmly. He appealed to their commonality, what they had in common. He remembered the history of Israel before them, noting two very important things. First of all, he remembered that the good old days weren't always so good that God's people had a history of rejecting Moses and the prophets. And that history led them forward even to the point of rejecting the Messiah, Jesus himself. And then he took issue with the temple. The temple, which had been preceded by the tabernacle, could never adequately contain God. But the temple had become an idol to the people even though it was temporary, even though it was transitory. So Stephen condemned their unbelief and the rejection of the Messiah, and yet he prayed for their salvation even as he was being stoned by them. The words, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Well, what was the result? Stephen was still stoned. There was a good result, but not in the way that we'd expect. We see that Stephen had this vision as he was received into glory, that even before he fell asleep, he looked into heaven and saw Jesus at the right hand of God. Also caused persecution, widespread persecution brought about by people like Saul, who was standing there watching the coats. And it broke out against the Christian church. And the Christians were forced to flee Jerusalem. They were scattered. But interestingly enough, this only caused the church to grow and spread even more. You see, the appointment of others in the mission the appointment of others to help out and to be equipped to do much more of the work of the ministry was one of the most important things that happened in the early church. Because it wasn't just the apostles that were called to serve God. Every Christian was called to follow Jesus and to be part of a caring community. So whenever people talk about church, we're talking about ourselves. We are the church. It's not anybody else's responsibility, but ours. The New Testament reminds us that the church is God's people coming together to listen to God and to receive God's forgiveness and God's guidance and to be disciples who actively love God and love one another and the wider community. A great example of this that someone asked me about last week is Stephen ministry. They said, what is this Stephen ministry? They're here this morning. And uh, we got a chance to talk about that. It wasn't a special you know, type, but it is a ministry, a program that gives lay people over 50 hours of training in Christian caregiving. And then these people, of course, are well-equipped and supervised so that they might be matched up with someone of the same gender going through a life crisis. And people go through life crises all the time. You can name them yourself. And if they're matched, that's fine with someone else. And if they're not, they're basically a Stephen minister at large in the congregation using their training to continually give care to the people. This morning, I'd like you to remember one key thing. 
and that is that faith is not a passive word. Faith is an active word. Hence the teaching title, Hands-On Faith. We're called to practice hands-on faith. But you don't have to be a Stephen minister to practice hands-on faith. People with hands-on faith, they can practice that like the fellow that was memorialized yesterday in tightening little bolts underneath the pews with an Allen wrench that work themselves loose when people use them to get up and sit down. Little things that no one ever noticed or maybe he was ever thanked for. Hands-on faith is used when people change light bulbs or when they look for leaks, solve them. Hands-on faith is when they prepare for fellowship and clean up afterward or when goodies for people to enjoy over a cup of coffee as they get to know others in the body of Christ. Hands-on faith is when they help in any way with worship Hands-on faith is when they greet visitors and guests and to give them the welcome that they first received. People use hands-on faith when they help out in any way that you can think of to help the mission of the congregation move forward. Hands-on faith is used when people sing and when they pray and when they get outside of themselves to care for someone else. All Christians are called to use hands-on faith, especially me and you. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, keep reminding us we are your hands and feet in this world. By your powerful spirit, by your powerful Holy Spirit, O Lord, move each one to hands-on faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue with the hymn of the day as you find it in the bullet. Together we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Stephen spoke your truth with conviction, and the people rejected him. May we find the strength that transcends our desire not to lose popularity, approval, or our own security for the sake of your gospel's justice. God of wisdom. The early church's neglect of their widows demonstrates how easily even people of faith forget to care for the vulnerable among us. Keep us mindful of others' needs amid our many competing concerns. God of wisdom. We pray for the safe travel and return of all in the congregation that are heading north at this time. May you wrap them in your protection until they return here in the fall. God of wisdom. Protect those who are endangered by the physically, emotionally, and spiritually abusive and help them to escape unsafe environments where their well-being is threatened, especially Christians persecuted in many countries. Heal the sick in body and soul. God of wisdom. For Stephen and all the faithful martyrs, we give you thanks and look to their faithful examples of how to live as your followers, God of wisdom. We pray for all of our mission congregations and the Grand Canyon Synod. We also pray for our local partners in mission, Faith Lutheran Church and Christ the Redeemer Anglican Church, along with our care ministries that serve the needs of others, such as Christ Care, Divorce Care, Stephen Ministry, Grief Share, and Mental Health Ministry. May they reach all people in need, God of wisdom. Together we pray, Lord, help us, your believers, become disciples who worship regularly, love unconditionally, listen compassionately, speak truthfully, act justly, endure patiently, forgive mercifully, give generously, serve selflessly, invite constantly, pray fervently, witness unashamedly, and live worthily. Incline your ear to our prayers and fill us with power to begin living out our faith by the power of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, the green slips and offerings are received in the plates by the doors, but we continue with the offering response. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, in mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
Do this also for the remembrance of me. We pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Our community assistants will come forward.
Please stand. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you safe in his grace until everlasting life. We pray, Holy One, we give you thanks that in its bread and cup we have feasted again on your endless love. Let that love overflow more and more in our lives that we may be messengers to prepare your way, harvesters of justice and peace and bearers of your eternal word our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with our sending hymn. We want to thank the live stream congregation for worshiping with us. Send any prayer requests you desire in so we may help you in that way. For the congregation here, there is a time of fellowship in the fellowship hall following the service. There, is pl there are plenty of goodies there for you and great fellowship. Always remember that Almighty God has created you and has a purpose for your life every day. Lord, help us remember if you are not dead. Live your lives in Christ, rooted and built up in him, and abound in thanksgiving. And the blessing of the Holy Trinity, one God, be upon you and remain with you forever. Go in peace. Christ is sending you.